Okay. I guess we'll see. Some under, it made some sense to really understand what's the data, so what is the use look like, where are the capacity issues, actually put some science behind this before we put some investment into um, new parking inventory or parking management programs. So we hired Rick Williams Consulting, he does this up and down the Pacific Northwest. Yeah. Right? Yep. Um, I've worked with him in the past in other communities to do a parking utilization study. Where we're at in that process is they finished collecting the data, they're going to present that to us today. They're then going to solicit some comments from us and um, in terms of what we think outside of sort of your traditional new parking inventory, what are some other things we could be thinking of. And then they're going to come back to us with some recommendations on how to alleviate where we have capacity issues um, and then also what future potential investments would look like. So we still have some information that's going to be coming down down the road. I think by the end of this calendar year, you should be more or less set yes. the, yep. the calendar Sorry. right now. The uh, future parking inventory sites that will be presented as a real estate discussion, so that will probably be in a proprietary position. We will we'll share what the outcomes are in terms of do we need new inventory or not, but not the actual location so that the city can be looking at those opportunities as a real estate. Um, but with that, I think I'll just hand it over to you and you guys can proceed with the presentation. Great, Good. thank you. Well, uh, yeah, thanks for uh, coming everybody. I'm Pete Collins from Rick Williams Consulting. Owen Ron Kelly with Rick Williams Consulting. And uh, sorry we're a little bit late, we got comments of traffic. Uh, appreciate you guys bearing with us. We have about 26 slides. Uh, I'm gonna be covering the first half. Uh, talking about the inventory, all the work we did initially coming down and surveying the area, and then Owen will take over the second half, talking, diving into the data a little bit more. And if if you want, if you if you want to ask questions as you go along, we can do that, or we can wait till the end as well. So we do have a microphone that we can circulate around here, but feel free to raise your hand or ask questions as we go along. But hopefully, we will answer most of your questions in terms of uh, the data and the inventory as we go along. Thanks. Yeah, and so uh, I think we're going to skip the introductions. We just told you who we are. We're, we're going to go into the project update, um, so give you a bit of a status, and then go into the data findings, and then uh, talk about next steps. So that's when we'll hear back from you guys where, where you'd like to go with this project a little bit. Um, so the project status. So um, in May, we came down and did an inventory. So we inventoried 100% of the on and off street data. Um, and we'll show a slide of the study area so you can visually see where we came down and took all the information of uh, the on-street data as well as the off-street. Um, we then completed 10 hour, a 10-hour data collection. So we did one in June, so we were trying to capture uh, the school when school was still in session as well as when we came down initially. We heard capturing the farmer's market um, traffic and parking was a, was a big implication. Uh, and then we came back in the height of the summer, so August 5th, so uh, when things were really bustling. We shifted some of the hours, too, that we came down, which you'll see in future, a uh, couple of future slides. Um, and then we compiled everything. And so we're in, that's what the process we're in right now. So we're really diving into the data, putting everything together, and we're just about done with it. Um, so you'll see it pretty soon, as, around September 30th. Um, and then in October, we're going to come back, review that data, uh, and present some initial strategies that we came with, that we can kind of call from that data using industry best practices and then understanding what your, the problems you guys are facing in McMinnville. Uh, bring all that together in a draft report and then um, narrow those strategies down into strategy recommendations that we think are applicable here. Uh, and then a final report, which as Heather said, will be before the end of the year. So hopefully you, you guys can see all of that. So that's the study area that we looked at. So, yes? Oh. Stakeholder Advisory Committee. So there is a, there's a Stakeholder Advisory Committee that we in, met with initially. They helped us uh, identify the study area itself along with city staff. So that's how we determined uh, the area that we were surveying and the hours that we were doing it as well. Yeah. 
And so um, it was a pretty good sized study area. We were trying to capture that third street, so capturing a lot of the traffic that that's coming, that's really impacting your downtown retail core. Um, and you can see north, you have Fifth Street, and so you have the Fifth Street garage, uh, and then diving up a little bit, uh, if I had a little pointer, uh, going to the, the urban renewal district that, that came to be, uh, and then First Street to the south, and then on the west side, you have Adams, Birch, and Alder, and then on the east side, pretty much you have uh, Third Mile Lane. So again, the, th the survey days were a typical school day. So Thursday, June 8th, and then we came back in August. Uh, we did hourly turnover and hourly occupancy. So turnover is an important indication of, of parking. So we are collecting, uh, we dispensed, we sent out our survey crew uh, with a clipboard and they're writing down license plates. So we understand how many unique vehicles are coming down here and then we can see how uh, well utilized each stall is being uh, used. Uh, so in turnover is an indication of how often that turn, that stall is really being used. Uh, within that parking area that you just saw on the previous slide, there were 2,845 total stalls. So 798 on street. So that's about 28%. And then about two, two, a little over 2,000, 72% on 75 sites off street. So the, including the garage, and many um, off-street lots. Um, from that, we surveyed um, 2,464 or 2, total stalls. So we captured all of the on-street that was in that area. So all 798. And then we captured a really significant sample of the off-street. So we worked with Heather uh, to figure out exactly which sites we wanted to capture that would be representative of land use, uh, different size, the sizes, different uses. Um, so it was about 81% on 42 sites. So uh, we also captured the, the public lots too. Uh, and in four of the public lots, we did uh, turnover. So we were actually writing down license plates on the, the I think you have four uh, lots that are publicly owned that have two hour time limits on those. So we captured, we wrote down license plates on those. So understanding how well each one of those stalls is really being, being used. Uh, then we break it down into different use types. So here's the on-street parking inventory where uh, you can kind of understand what is the mix of uses that you have. So you have a 10 minute stall, 15 minute stall, only one of each, 35% uh, are two hour stalls. So a good amount within that downtown supply on street that is of the 798 are, uh, are two hours or signed two hours. Uh, and then you have ADA accessible 21 stalls uh, the vast majority are no limit. So it's it's 61, a little over 61%. So that's a pretty high number for a downtown retail core. Um, but we, we'll get into some of the more nuances of the data in a minute. So off-street inventory, again, it was, we captured a little over 2,000. Um, uh, and I'm sorry, we, we captured 1,666 on 42 uh, sites. And uh, so that's about 81%. And again, we captured those off street sites uh, that are two hour signed, uh, so that ha which have 138 stalls on them. So which make up about 7% of that off street supply. Uh, here you can kind of, you can see the actual inventory map of all the off street sites that we looked at. So again, uh, it's a little fuzzy. I hope you can, everyone can see, but we really tried to capture everything or as many as we could uh, and capturing different sizes. You can at least see kind of a footprint of the different sizes there. And then I think at this point, Owen's gonna talk about some of the off street or on street and off street performance. So one of the things that we obviously want to look at is um, we, we do this, the way that we conduct our surveys, we send out our survey crews and we survey every hour on the hour. So the whole idea is that we're collecting data for a parking space, an on-street parking space, exactly the hour of when we did it the last time. So we're out there, uh, we started at 10 a.m. Um, on the weekday and we went to 8 p.m. on the, the Saturday or the weekend data 
Um, we started at 11 a.m. and we went and all the way till nine o'clock because we really wanted to try to capture uh, that evening traffic, uh, uh, those that are coming down for restaurants or down there for entertainment purposes. So uh, this is what uh, hourly occupancies look like um, across the board. So the dark color there is the weekday data and uh, the light color is the, the Saturday or weekend data. And so as you can see, um, the, the weekday data is, is uh, a lot more, a lot stronger activity occurs on the weekday. And I'll be honest with you, when we first met, I, that isn't what I anticipated. I anticipated seeing a little bit more on the weekends, but I think uh, the employee traffic because of the, the office-based businesses that are here really are driving a lot of those numbers. And again, this is just on street. So if we dig into the data a little bit uh, more thoroughly, you can see the, the direct comparison of the peak hour. They shared a peak hour, um, both weekend and weekday at 1 to 2 p.m. Um, and the, uh, the on-street system got as high as 63% uh, on, on the weekday. Now keep in mind, this is all of the on-street stalls in that entire boundary. So it's not just the retail core, but it also incorporates the, the areas on the fringe as well. And so what you'll see later is that those fringe areas have a lot less uh, activity on them. And so it brings the overall average down, uh, which is why you're seeing that 63% there. Um, there's uh, 100 fewer stalls available in the on street on the, on the weekdays. So um, definitely a lot more activity on street. One thing you'll see in the next slide is that there is a high violation rate despite the average length of stay. And one of the things that we try to aim for, we encourage cities to try to aim for, is to have a, a violation rate. These are people that are staying beyond the posted time stays. Uh, we aim for a, a five to 9% a window uh, in terms of those that are violating. And you'll see that here in the next slide. Uh, so on the, on the far right over there, the interesting thing that I, I do want to point out is that we, we break these down by stall type. So over on the left, it's got the two hour sign stalls and then the no limit. And so we look at them independently of one another to see how each of those categories is performing. And of your two hour sign stalls, it's 82% occupied in the peak hour from, um, from noon to 1 p.m which is very reflective of that retail core. So you guys have got a very active downtown core uh, that's super busy at the middle of the day. And so we only have 49 on-street stalls available in, in, the, in the two hour supply. The interesting thing I wanted to note is that um, those that are staying in those stalls stay an average of one hour and 34 minutes, which is great. That's, that's a great turnover. That's, that's something we like to see because those stalls are turning over regularly throughout the day. So you're your, that one stall is supplying capacity for at least six cars over the course of the business day. Over a 10 hour business day, you could have six cars that park in that space. The thing I do wanna point out though, is that the violation rate is almost at 13%. So while the average time stay is good, you also have people that are staying in these stalls uh, much longer than they should. And as a, as a result, um, we're seeing a little bit higher violation right there. And so, you're and you're right kind of at an equilibrium with a with a average occupancy of 82 percent and a violation rate of 13 percent we could increase the enforcement a little bit which um which could help cr create a little bit more of that turnover and might bring down the that occupancy rate a little bit um which might be a recommendation that we will we'll come with but you don't really have to do anything at this point. I mean, that's you're kind of in an ideal window there for how those two hour stalls are operating. Comparatively speaking, if you look at Saturday, you know, there are people are staying in those stalls almost two hours, uh, but the violation rate is higher. So you have a lot more people that are staying longer on the weekends, which is probably not too big of a surprise there. Uh, but there is more availability. We're only looking at 73% uh, occupancy in that, in that same peak hour. And the no limit stalls, uh, again, not too surprising, you have a higher uh, length of stay there, three hours and 15 minutes during the weekday and three hours and 40 minutes uh, on the weekends. And again, a lot more stall availability there. And again, if we were to kind of draw, uh, if you were to draw a map of where these stalls are located, you've got those two hour stalls that are kind of clustered right around Third Avenue or Third Street, and then everything above and below and on the edges are those no limit stalls. 
Uh, so digging into the weeds a little bit further, one of the things that Pete uh, mentioned is that we do take license plate data and that's what allows us to know how long those vehicles are parking for. And so one other thing that we like to capture that um, other consulting firms don't do, I think as good a job is that we, we like to capture the number of, of vehicle trips. To me, that's a, it's kind of a bellwether of how many of how your downtown is doing. And so we like to create a baseline when we first go into a community and identify how many vehicles are actually coming into the downtown. It's a, it's a measure of vibrancy and then coming back in another, you know, a couple of years, three years and doing the study again, you can kind of compare against these numbers. So uh, as an example, uh, during the weekday, you had 1,938 trips that were, came into the downtown. This is in the entire study area. But conversely, on the weekend, you only had about 1,400. So there's quite a significant difference. And these are, these are trips that are just occurring on street. We're not talking about people who are parking off street. Um, and then we also calculate along with it is vehicle hours parked. And so that, that's just a function of how long people are parked on street for. Turnover, um, this factors in those that are staying longer. And so I said those two hour stalls were turning over about six times in a day. Overall, if you, if you average everything together, you're at about, you know, little four, almost 4.7 turns in a day for your average stall in the downtown on your weekday. On the weekend, you only get four turns. Which in, in, in theories, you know, that's, that's fine. I think it's actually a pretty high number considering the, the, the high number of no limit stalls that you guys have. Um, we, and the other two metrics we do like to track is how many people are parking on street for five hours or more? Who, who, who are the people who are, are just parking on street and deliberately want to um, uh, stay longer than any, any of posted time stays? And we only measure those that are, are uh, parked in time limited stalls. So these are vehicles that we observed in those two hour stalls over the course of the day. It's not a significant number, which is a good thing. So there's, we only found that 26 vehicles, only 1% of um, your, your activity level uh, are staying five hours or more. And the last thing is we like to look at is something called moving to evade. We can track license plates as they move around in the downtown. So people will come in and park and, and because those two, since those two hour stalls are really convenient for everybody, everybody wants to park right in those, those two hour stalls. And then maybe on a, on a coffee break or a smoke break, you want to go outside and move your car and they'll move around to another convenient two hour space. So you don't have to park further away. And we just call that moving to evade. So you avoid getting a citation for those spots. Again, uh, 111, I mean, that's, it's not insignificant, but it's 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 not anything that you need to worry about at this point. You know, given given occupancies where they are, but uh, something to, to definitely keep in mind. With a little bit of added enforcement, I'm sure that you'd see that number fall. Uh, yeah, again, this is going through similarly uh, what was in the previous table. So, again, the the turnover rate is about six turns for those two-hour stalls. The average turnover rate is about as as little less than five, um, and uh, yeah, it, those those vehicles that are are doing that moving to evade, we we typically assume that they are employees moving from place to place for the most convenient parking spaces. Uh, that's certainly what we uh, what we've seen before, but that's not always the case. Sometimes, uh, especially in a, a, a downtown that's spread out quite a bit. You know, people will come in and park and, and do whatever they're going to do nearby, get back in their car and go to the other end of town and run another errand or something like that. And that's when they'll show up in this, this moving to evade analysis. So the off street. Off street is uh, overwhelmingly uh, more active during the, the weekday. Uh, so much so we're, you know, 58% in the peak hour uh, during the weekday and the weekend um, is got as high as 26%. So there's a lot of availability off street. So, um, you know, it, it, it does mirror the on street system. You know, it's, it is significantly higher, but um, there's, a, there's a disparity, quite a disparity, I would say. Um, in the on and off street system on the weekends. And so um, when you have activities in downtown, I know you guys got some, some big events that you do here. And I know that you guys do do some uh, shared off street 
uh, uses, but that would be a great way to incre increase capacity when you do have large events or you're planning for large events, um, that there, we take advantage of that uh, capacity in the off-street system, particularly on the weekends. Excuse me. Yeah. Know how much is considered business off street versus the actual parking off street that the city provides? Yeah, we. Yes, we. Um, you'll see a more fine grained approach to just that very question uh, when we when we publish the report. So you'll see that in the next couple of weeks. We're actually just teasing out some of that additional analysis. So we're looking specifically at just the city. Uh, own facilities that are are catering to the the, the customer and visitor uh, versus private, and so yeah, I mean a lot of that reason for that low occupancy is that those are access what we call accessory lots, and that they're only to be used for that those specific businesses. So that's exactly right. How does, how does church parking factor in that? Church parking is great. Um, church parking, um, in a lot of instances, can be a great resource if the church is willing to allow other users in, into that facility. So in, in a lot of instances, in areas where um, commuter parking is, is a, an important thing, they'll use those facilities for parking rides. So they'll run shuttles to uh, a church lot during the work week and so people park there during the weekend but they they know that they need to be off the lot by you know six o'clock and they can't use it on the weekends so you identify that separately yeah we i, I don't no, we, every well every all different uses are are categorized so i don't know if we have a is there a church within the downtown that we use one at the is there one Several. Yeah. Oh. There's one. There's one specifically at the east end. That's a big one too. That oh. had a lot of availability on okay. it too. So. Yeah. 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 So and one of the things that we attempted to do, and I, I will need your feedback on it when you see the report. Um, and then we will get with Heather too to make sure that we that we're capturing it properly. Because one of the things we do when we're when we're doing the off street inventory is that we're we send out experienced guys that are are very really good at doing inventory work. So we try to categorize those off street stalls um, by use type. So if we can, sometimes we'll just lump it into like a multi tenant or mixed use. So it's going to have. Uh, professional office space it's going to have a little bit of retail into it so we just put that into a mixed use pot but then there's other things like um, churches or um, civic institutions like city hall lots or um, medical office sometimes those are standalone uses so we'll identify those uh, in office specifically so and then what we try to do is we'll run an analysis for those for how off-street occupancies are performing and we'll do it by use type but that's based on the assumption of what we observe when we're out there doing the inventory in the first place. So sometimes we'll miscategorize what that lot should be used for. This is this is clearly a, a, a lot that should be used for library use and not, um, you know, uh, for people who are going to the restaurant downtown or going to the pub, that kind of thing. So we want to make sure that we get those how we're categorizing by land use type as best we can. And that's also something we're going to do in our um, parking demand analysis, too. We'll look at the square footage, the occupied square footage versus how much parking is associated with that use type. And we'll compare it back and forth. So. We, we want to get a good sense of how many stalls are required for a certain type of use. So are you requiring three stalls per thousand square feet of office space when somebody is going to pull their permits to build a new office? Um, those are the things that we're going to kind of compare and contrast. We like doing the, the demand analysis. We call it true demand mm -hmm. because it's there's what it says in your code, but we want to know how it's actually performing on the street. So um, if there's specifically, it works really well for accessory uses. So if there's a bank and you go and you look at the bank, so anybody parking on that lot can only be there for bank purposes, right? So we want to go and find the absolute peak hour of when they have the most cars parked on that lot. And then we'll, um, use that number and divide it back across the square footage of that building. And so we'll know by square feet how many stalls 
per thousand will, are required for that type of use. And we'll use multiple examples of that to come up with an average of what banks maybe sh may that are actually using today. And so it can, those types of numbers can be used for future planning or if you're looking at doing code amendments in the future, possibly reducing your um, minimum requirements for parking for some of those those uses and that's what we do a lot when we go into different communities a lot of people are are looking at revising their parking codes downward because um, sometimes what they're finding from development point of view is that um, developers were would like to go in and build a facility but they require too much parking to be used on site which reduces their overall building area um, and it doesn't their performance doesn't work and so by doing this demand analysis, it can really help the city determine how much people are really using parking for, and it can also help developers when they look at you know how much they should be providing going forward. So you have a minimum, and sometimes you have a maximum. Sometimes there's no maximum, but um, we can. I mean, traditionally, that's all done through um, ITE. The um, help me out. Uh, internet. Uh, international transportation uh, in, or tr transportation engineers. Yeah. Why am I blanking in the eye? Sorry. <laughs> yeah, I, I, yeah. So Institute of Transportation Engineers. Yeah. They do, and what they do is they pull in their demand analysis from all over the country. So one of the things that we like doing is um, going to community and just using the community-based information, but we'll also bring in averages from similar type communities if that's desired. Yeah, exactly. Right. And sometimes ITA uses uh, numbers that are really not applicable to smaller communities or, yeah. Right, it, right. it might be a suburb in Iowa or something like that that doesn't necessarily translate. And so, yeah, we have lots of numbers that we can bring in that correlate more specifically to specific Pacific Northwest and Oregon. Yeah. Um, happy to discuss more. We'll, we'll, we can keep going through slides, but if you guys do have more questions, keep them coming. Um, so we did look at, we identified six uh, lots in the downtown that uh, during the peak hour were over 85%. And we, do, we use 85% as kind of our threshold for, um, it's, it's kind of a, a stress factor when it comes to parking. We wanna make sure that people who are using a facility can circulate either through um, through the downtown looking for on-street parking or in an off-street situation where they're able to find a parking stall. If, it, if they find, if, if it's over 90%, there's, um, it creates angst in the user. They're not able to find parking. It's, it, um, you know, it gives you kind of a bad impression or a difficulty finding parking. And so we find that 85% is that, that threshold where you want to were uh, you would want to institute more management strategies to help reduce that demand uh, in the off street or an on street situation. So whether that's um, changing time limits, um, encouraging them to use other locations to park, those types of things um, will help bring that those numbers down. But we use 85% as that threshold. On the weekend, we only found that three lots were over 85% and one of them was a city owned lot. Um, I will say that uh, that f uh, four lots, four of those six are city-owned lots. To your question earlier about how many of those are customer visitor facilities, so there is a high demand for those city lots during the weekday. Um, when we quantify available stalls in the peak hour, we found that of all uh, of all of our sample size, which was 81 percent of your your total off-street supply, uh, 650 stalls are available in that peak hour. So there's a considerable amount of parking availability out there. Uh, and if you extrapolate that to the entire 100% sample, uh, you find that there's 854 uh, empty stalls in that peak hour. Similarly, on the weekend, we found 1,225. When that gets extrapolated, there's 1,500 stalls in the downtown that are available off street in that peak hour. Um, so one of the things we like to do is we, we create a heat map which shows uh, where the activities are happening in downtown in terms of, of parking. So um, it's that key is a little hard to see there, but everything that's in red is 85% or above. Everything in orange is 84 to 70%. Uh, the green is, uh, I want to say, 65 to 70. And then uh, the green is, is 65 and below. 
So it just at the first glance, the whole east end of the study area, tons of availability down there um, on street and off street. In that core area that um, we highlighted kind of a little box that we'll look at a little bit more in depth in a couple of slides, but that's your area of high occupancy where all of your on street is jammed up, a lot of your off street as well. Um, but you can just see just the use of color. Um, this is what the, the peak hour looks like on uh, a weekday. By contrast, this is what the weekend looks like. Lots of green, except for that center core that's right around Third Street. So, um, you know, as you can see, there's still a lot of red block faces in there and a couple of uh, red off street lots of there as well. But um, it, this, it's not a question if there's availability of parking, it's where you want it, you know, and, and everybody seems to want to park, right? right there on third and, and that shouldn't be too much of a surprise, but um, that's certainly what we're seeing. So this is a little close up of what we call our high occupancy node. So we will, we'll, as we, when we create those heat maps, we'll go back in and take a closer look at the areas that are, show a high intensity use. Um, and so in this instance, there's 55, 59 parkable block faces in this node and 32 of them during the peak hour on the weekday are 85% or better. So, you know, your downtown cooks. It's, 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 definitely, it's definitely got some, um, some constraint in the peak hour. And uh, similarly in the off street supply, you've got seven, seven of the 16 lots are 85% or better in that same peak hour in this node. Uh, I can, um, mm. uh, the railroad, there's the railroad on, uh, the far right. Um, so the, all those back up to the, the railroad line, um, it's fourth, is it street or Avenue? I apologize. Is it street? It's fourth street, uh, on the North and second on the South. And then this is one off the edge. So it's, uh, on the East, um, it's the one that runs right up along the that big or that big yellow lot up there is that in, insurance lot. Yes, yes, it sure is. Yep. Oh, okay. And so, what would what would that make the the western boundary there? Fit. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So um, taking a closer look, so um, we do a similar analysis that we showed you for the whole on-street system, um, do the same here, just as a comparison. In this node, we're just looking at that central node now. Uh, in the peak hour, you guys are hitting 86% in that peak. It's that noon to one peak for those uh, essentially two hour stalls on-street. 40, 47% of them, or I'm sorry, 47 stalls are available in that peak. So it's, there's definitely some constraint going on. We're looking at a sample size of 330 stalls yes, in that area. Includes ADA. Yes, it's, it's inclusive of ADA. The 20, so 26 stalls are available that are not ADA. Okay. Yeah, that very well could be. We can go back and we can tease, you know, find out precisely on that. Um, comparatively, the weekend is also very busy. So that's, that's one variation that we do see a little bit of a difference. So it's no question that people that are coming on the weekends want to spend time in the retail core. And it, that's evidence with uh, a 77% um, uh, utilization rate there uh, for the weekend on street there. Um, so you see a little bit less, like I said, a little bit less variation. So a lot of people, that's, that's your 100% corridor for sure. Uh, on the weekend, the off street, there's the, again, that really stark contrast there. You're at 80% occupancy. It's a, and that peak hour is a little bit later. That's 2 to 3 p.m. Um, 100 stalls available during that peak uh, off street. Uh, whereas the weekend, you only get up to 38% uh, occupancy in that same area. And uh, we do know that only one of those lots 
uh, that hit 85% in the peak hour on the weekends is the city owned lot. So other, other city owned lots are um, available in less than 85% in that peak hour. So just a you know finally um, you know the combined available stalls there's a there's a 240 stall difference in terms of availability um, in the in the peak hour on the weekend weekday versus weekend. So I think those the employees uh, play an important role in the downtown and they certainly add to a lot of the demand. Maybe less so on street, but overall they bring the entire system up. I'm trying to think if we do have the ADA on off street. I don't know if we set, I don't think that it was separated out for the off street system. We certainly can do it for on street. Yeah. Right. And uh, what you'll see in the, the report itself, we go through, we just identified um, for, for this presentation, we just identified the no limit stalls and the two hour stalls, but you'll also see a similar analysis that does the ADA stalls. So it'll show you what its peak hour is, when that is, uh, how many stalls are available in the peak, that sort of thing. And so it'll hopefully it'll be a lot more clear to you about how much they actually are being utilized or not in this case. So, um, I, I just threw this up together. Um, it's it's a it's a high occupancy no, but it's it's a combined on and off street. So this is this is kind of your entire parking system, because as we know, you know, even though we can't always access all of the off street lots, um, they do work in unison with each other. It is a parking system, so you have the off street and the on street, and as a combined unit, um, you know, if you got a peak hour of eighty percent at. Uh, at one in the afternoon on on weekdays, which is is really impressive. I mean, it's it's definitely a lot of activity going on here, and this is um, this is just that high occupancy node again, and by comparison, uh, fifty four percent on the weekend. So, major just kind of a summary of of the initial findings that we had. Um, the majority of the on street. Parking is formatted no limit. Uh, we might want to take a look at this. These might telegraph some of our our future recommendations that we have, and we'd certainly, you know, welcome any input that you guys have on this as well. But um, it, it favors. It does kind of favor a long-term system. You know, where, you know, if you get the majority of your supply catering to longer-term stays, you know, where people can park, employees can park on street all day. It has its place certainly, but. You've got a very constrained downtown. You might want to look at possibly expanding your two-hour time stay supply uh, to allow for greater turnover in a larger area. And that's those are those are what we consider the customer-friendly parking stalls. So those two-hour stalls uh, that are turning over more regularly. Um, On-street parking activity is is super robust on the weekdays, uh, particularly in the west end of the study area. Uh, the high occupancy node, does, it does exceed that 85% threshold uh, in the peak hour. Um, and the, uh, there, the one thing I will say is that despite the constraint that you find in that core, there is available parking nearby. I mean, it's, you, you have to walk a little bit further away, maybe two or three blocks, um, which, you know, might might be cumbersome for some um, and, and certainly it's not as desirable, but there is availability on street. You just have to, it's a little bit further away. And so, you know, one of the things that we're probably going to come back to you is to recommend that we get, first of all, that we add in more two hour time stays that we try to get the, the larger percentage of the system turning over more regularly. And we push those longer term users, um, you know, uh, essentially to the edges a little bit. So, because you want to free up that downtown core, that the core in the center to make sure that you're maintaining your turnover rate there. So that's probably something you're going to see from us there. Um, average length of stay, uh, you know, three hours is still pretty good when you factor in all the no limit stalls. But the good thing is, is that you're still less than two hours in those two hour time limited stalls. So people are respecting the time stay despite, you know, some violation rate there. 
And then finally, you know, there's, there is availability in those off street supply. And that's something we would encourage you to do. And, and we can work with you to try to um, establish a, a shared use uh, agreements that, that can be struck. Um, we'll want to take a look at your code and see if that, if your code allows for that, uh, particularly after the development has occurred. Um, because a lot of those accessory uses, they're in some cases they can be prohibitive about shared use after the fact, but uh, we'll, we'll definitely take a look at that. But there's an untapped supply there, uh, or underutilized supply, I should say, um, that we can plug some of those employee uses that may not have existing off-street uh, access right now. We can plug them into where there is availability. So if you, um, one of the things, I'm gonna skip ahead real quick to this picture. So this is, again, a heat map for your, for the entire downtown. There's a lot of availability on the, the east end of the study area. So if we can push some of our activity that don't need to access their vehicles uh, all the time, if we can push some of that activity to the east, um, that will create better availability in the core. Um, so yeah, uh, at this point, you know, just recapping what um, Pete opened with is that we were gonna come back to you with a full data summary uh, at the end of this month. Uh, we'll have all those breakouts of individual stall types. Um, there might be a recommendation if, if um, you know, some of these ADA stalls are, are completely underutilized that, you know, maybe we look at strategic locations for them and, and possibly try to pair back on them as an option. Uh, not that you'd have to proceed with anything like that, but, um, you know, in that core area specifically, it's, uh, there's, it's a tight supply. So any additional turns, because what we've found is that, um, at least in what we saw in Portland for some time because they weren't policed very well is people would put a handicap placard up, park in those spaces all day long. So it was an employee that was coming downtown, they put up their handicap placard and they just parked on street all day. Um, and so when they, certainly it wasn't the case for all of them, but when they came up with a two tiered handicap placard system where those that actually needed to use a physical wheelchair or those types of uses, um, and those that did not, um, we saw that there was a lot of attrition in the system. So those that ha didn't have the wheelchair requirement had to adhere to that time stay. They got a one hour grace period. So if it was a two hour time stay, they were allowed three hours and then those stalls started turning over and they, um, because they were beginning to be enforced. And uh, it was amazing the difference. It freed up a ton of uh, on street uh, ADA stalls in the downtown. It was really significant. Yeah. So, uh, my distance to the is the number of spaces based on the public um, right-of-way accessibility guidelines that are published in the Denver Right should require a certain percentage of ADA stall, stalls per number of marked stalls. And so the, the number of stalls is based on those requirements. Um, certainly have the ability to move them <coughs> It's interesting that um, I, we find that cities have different interpretations of that. Um, certain that's certainly the case for all, all off-street and you know outright. So all off-street facilities are, have to have a certain number of ADA accessible stalls based on the, the total number of stalls that are on the site. We've heard looser interpretations of the on-street uh, versions of that, and so. Um, where they're they're looking for it um, at, by request in some instances, or that people say that um, it should be every few blocks or or something to that effect. But um, what so I we have to report it and share it with you on the block yeah. where they're at, and the fact that they're based on the program guidelines. So there are issues that have been sued over that, and that's I think the last thing we want to have happen here. Sure. Yeah. yeah. That's great. Thank you. Uh, Process question. Did you take license plates of every vehicle on street and off street? Um, no, we, 
uh, only we typically only do on street for the license plates. There was a few examples where we did do uh, license plates off street, but it was only in those public two hour um, designated off street locations. It, correct. We did include. We did not t take plates in that in that facility. Very great point. Uh, that's one of the things that we try to do, particularly when we set the, the data collection date, is we want to we check ahead of time. We want to make sure that there's no major anomalies that are happening that day, that it's not happening on um, you know the UFO Fest weekend. We, we want to make sure that it's not like a, a super peak week. Uh, weekend, but we also want to make sure that it's not going to be, you know, um, a Labor Day weekend or, so, or something to that effect. You know, we want to make sure that it's, we, we aim for typical because that's the best thing you can plan for in your system. That's what you have most control over. So when you implement your management practices, it's going to be based on how we want the system to be managed 320 days out of the year kind of thing. So that's that's how we chose the day we did. But uh, to your point, you said that there are different anomalies and to the um, gentleman's point earlier about the church lots, that's that's a difficulty in, in using some of those off street facilities um, because you know they'll have funerals uh, that they can't that they don't know when they're happening and so they don't they want to make sure that they have access for their patrons that are coming to a funeral service. Um, that's you know, unscheduled or in the middle of the day, and if they're not going to allow other people onto their lots, if that's you know something that they're catering to, so there's definitely a lot of different anomalies out there that either will make additional hurdles uh, to make it difficult to get into some of those. Uh, of those. You know, there is an example, um, Salem. Um, they actually they handle they do a employee database where they require businesses in the downtown core to provide the city with their license plate because they have they have a requirement that no employee is allowed to park on street in the downtown district and so and if they find you and they find that license plate um, they will cite you for that or the first of all they'll give you a note and say there's plenty of available uh, parking in these off street facilities here's a, a permit you can buy a permit to to you know to use these facilities but we don't want to see you on street anymore if you get a second um, notice it'll it'll be a citation so there are a few communities out there that are tracking that sort of thing um, what we do with our data is it's basically based on time stay. I mean, we, we make an assumption is that people who are staying four hours or more are probably employees. Um, that's the best that we can really do unless we were standing there watching them get out of their car and then walk into the business and knowing that they sat down behind a desk or something. It's difficult to do. Yeah. Uh, do you have a specific breakdown on the uh, parking garage? Uh, you use the parking garage? And, uh, and yeah, absolutely. So we have, we can... Um, yeah, sure can. So this is only at the peak hour, but at the peak hour, uh, 1 to 2 p.m., it's, you know, 60, sorry, it's seven, between 70 and 55% occupied. Yes. And what, what we're working on, too, this is just, uh, this is just the peak hour. So we're, you'll see similar iterations of this, of heat maps, but over the course of the day, so each hour. So maybe that then you'll be able to see those color iterations change over the course of the day. That's right. So you differentiate between level one and level two. We did not. It was it was it was the data was collected as a unit. Yeah. But there was definitely, you know, anecdotally when when we when we were out there, level one's yeah. 
really full. The second level has got a lot more availability on it. Um, and it, like Pete just said, we'll hand, we'll give uh, Heather a, a PDF packet that has every hour with individual heat maps. And the cool thing is, as you kind of, you can see the ebb and flow of traffic and where it goes over the course of the day. So you just hit the advance button and it'll just replace that image with the colors. And so it's, you can really see the transition of where people are coming from and going to over the course of the day. It's Um, to be candid, I think that if there was, um, if there was some maintenance work done on that facility, it would be absolutely full 100% of the time. I think that there's, you know, it just from a lighting standpoint, um, from, uh, just a cleaning and sweeping and that sort of thing and signage, uh, I guarantee you that thing would be full all the time. So there's, there is availability in it right now, not a lot, but some, and I think they can be well utilized, particularly on the weekends with some good signage. Yeah, more than likely. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. Following up on the parking garage, um, there was no jury orientation done on June 8th, which allows for another mm -hmm. Not factoring in trials, mm -hmm. orientation could really. Okay. Yeah. Those sure. And, and are are jurors uh, directed to park in that facility, or? They're told that there's a parking structure there. Okay. And it's right across the street from the courthouse. Mm -hmm. So if, if they can't get the little two-hour spaces right around the courthouse, of which there's maybe. Fifteen. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. The yeah. next closest would be the parking garage. Okay. No, that, that's good to know. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Question for you, Tom. Many years ago, there was a permit that people owned up in Nanaimo could get that gave more flexibility in the parking. Is that still available? I can try to answer that for you. If you'd like, I mean, we have to wear photo photographs. Um, so there are permits available for downtown residents. We only issue two per block. Um, so you know, there's two different people that live downtown. I can only do one per residence, and I told them two per block. But they are still available. And what and what flexibility do they have? Um, I have the ability to assign them a, a lot. Either so, like say we live in the former block where the same restaurant is, I can assign that person a spot. Not a spot, but I can assign them to the lot. Um, or if they live in the 300 block, I might assign them to 4th Street um, back there. So, you would not have to be assigned to the space. Not, not a space, but I assign them a block base where they need to be. They, I mean, they cannot be on 3rd Street, can't be on any of the sides like Davis or Evans, Cowles. It has to be on 3rd Street or a parking lot or the city of Moss. So, I'd be happy to talk with you more about it. Is that, is that significant enough that it plays into it? Well, I have follow-up questions. So, yeah, do you know how many are issued, or? Oh, no kidding. Okay. Right. I, I was just wondering how well it's it's known for for downtown residents to be aware of that. So. Yeah. Oh. Right. Sure. Mm -hmm. um, they're, 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 they're,
um, last week I was driving a different vehicle myself, an old truck, and one of my tenants, not knowing it was mine, actually went out there and moved it to the street. Wow. In a few hours zone, where of course I got a ticket. Uh, oh. <laughs> this is how people that deal with the parking issue downtown feel about it. It becomes a very sort of irritating emotional issue. Mm -hmm. um, and we've been talking about parking for decades, of course. This is the most thorough study we've ever had. And I'm anxious to hear uh, your suggestions because um, if it's abstract, we don't do anything. I don't know if people that aren't involved daily downtown realize that it, it takes a toll on people that are downtown. When you say there's always parking, but it's a two or three, maybe two or three blocks away, you have a part of groceries that's really Sure, sure. Yeah, your, your comment is, a, is, a, is very appropriate. I mean, it's. Um, Honestly, that's that's why I like doing this job. I mean, it's people are passionate about parking. I mean, it, everybody's everybody has a parking experience, right? Everybody, most people have a car, and most people have experienced frustration going around a block. And and you know, I've got bigger problems over here than you got down here. And um, you know, this is and, you know when you when there's a scarcity or when there's a um, scarcity of, of available parking or a constraint in the system, you know. That's when the rubber does meet the road for a lot of people. I mean, that's that's when tough decisions have to be made. To be made, and um, that's why when we'll come back to you with some strategies, they're they're not all going to sit well. You know, it's it's it, there's it's a scarce supply. We need to identify who the the highest and best user of that stall is, and who do we want parking there, and when, and then um, you know and. You know, one of the strategies that we try to do is we try to push the peak or try to get people who are parking in the peak hour move to area. We want to move them from an area of red to area of green if we can. And we can do that through incentives, uh, different time stays, um, management, and just in telling people that it's there's available parking. You can park there all day on street if you want. Um, but it's also allowing for those people who are picking up and dropping off groceries and those types of things too, which is really important. Oh, I, I was just going to say, I, I completely agree that, yeah, parking is a very emotional issue, and it's one thing we always lead off with and talk about when we do these these presentations. Uh, and hopefully, and it's oft, oftentimes it's a perception issue. Sometimes and in this regard, you actually, there is a fair amount of parking happening downtown, which is a great thing. But hopefully some of this, these objective numbers they, they will really kind of help everyone get on board. So we're, we're simply collecting the data. So I think hopefully then it will speak for itself in many regards. So I just I want to make sure we don't miss Marilyn's point. So one of, one of our objectives today was sort of collect next steps feedback. Yeah. And one of the things that I'm hearing is user-specific strategies. So residential um, parking strategies, employee parking strategies, it's clear the weekdays are um, employee parking, overnight strategies, because we're having more overnights downtown, looking at user-specific strategies and what we can do mm -hmm. for parking relative to them. Mm -hmm. Great. Visitors. Yep. You know, I do think that uh, in my experience, at least, uh, downtown Eagle has a much higher portion of residents than most of the places you're probably looking at. The second story works in all these buildings. With residential, there are a lot of people living downtown, and you might very well be mistaking those for employees if you're just looking at how long somebody parked somewhere. Uh, that is an interesting, <coughs> not even a Yeah, yeah. Well, the one thing I'll say is that, um, you know, a, a parking problem is a good thing. I mean, it, it, it doesn't it doesn't sound that way, right? But uh, if you, if you have a parking problem, then you got a successful downtown. You're doing something right. Um, that's we like getting called into work on uh, communities that have a parking problem because a lot of the time it is a, a perception and reality thing. A lot of time we'll go into a community where people think they've got a problem, and we show them the numbers, and we're like, well, you know, you may not have a as much of a problem as you think. Um, and so we can work on those strategies and you know, the direct question back to, to Heather about this is, um, you know, what is, what is the, what is your tolerance for allowing employees to be able to park on street in the periphery all day? Are you, I mean, 
in a sense where you, you're allowing it now by having those no limit stalls, but what about authorizing it by posting time stays and saying, this is a two hour stall or a three hour stall or by permit. And you would issue permits to employees in the downtown to have them be able to park on street in an area of the downtown that has lots of availability. We would never try to put those employees on street in an area that's designated for customer turnover. But that was, that was a strategy that we used in Springfield. We went through and that was one of those towns that they, they thought they had a parking problem. And it turns out they, they had very little problem really. As a matter of fact, we wanted to get people on the street to make it look like that there was, there was more activity going on there. And what we did is we created donuts uh, around the, the core. So on the core, it was, two, it was two hours parking on street for free. And then around that, you, we had three hour parking or by permit. And so that three hour parking, people could stay longer. They could choose to stay longer if they were just a customer or visitor, but they also had the option of getting um, a really cheaper, super inexpensive on-street permit that would allow them to, that would authorize them to be able to park in this zone on street all day. And it, it really kind of, it showed more activity on street. And I think it played really well uh, to folks and it got people who were currently parking off street in some of those free city lots um, to use for those customers to come into downtown. And, and they really signed them up really nicely. They did a really good job of their sign package to say uh, that this is, this is free customer and visitor parking. And you guys actually do a pretty good job of that yourselves. You get good sign lots. So. We will have to address employee parking and residential parking are part of Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I think you, yeah, first. Except for the period between Memorial Day and Labor Day, which, of course, that's right when you study it. Sure. There were a significant number of people, significant as relative, I would say it was significant, that were using the parking spaces in the parking garage with and without vehicles. Can't be. Homeless mm -hmm. people. Wow. Did you find... Obviously, they were in the parking garage during your study. I don't know where they were, but did you find that as an issue? Because maybe that's another group that... So, Armin, when doing the weekend parking study uh, and the Fifth Street garage, there are probably six homeless people in there, I would say. So, yes, I, I saw that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, do you make recommendations? <laughs> that's, uh, that's a tough one. <laughs> we we do we do we do yeah, parking, yeah. Do parking management. Uh, do they ma do they have a monthly permit for that spot or? Yeah, <laughs> yeah I don't know. It's uh, we we try not to step on civic issues. Um, it's but I mean there are strategies that can be done to um, to either activate those spaces and encourage more people to use it, which would um, leave little room for other users. You know, there's things that you can encourage use of those facilities. Um, you can, right, sure, yeah, exactly. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Assume that 37 of that actually needs to come out. 
Yeah, no, thank you for that. Because um, I think there was a delay in when we actually did the, the inventory itself to when we actually collected the data. It was available when you guys did inventory. Right. Mm -hmm. No, thank you for that. We'll, we'll, we'll take care of that. We'll reduce that number. Other questions or comments? Sorry? Yeah, a little bit. Sure. Yeah. So, yeah, so again, one of the things that we'll come back with uh, next time uh, in October is we'll, we'll begin to develop some initial strategies for you to, to take a look at. Uh, Pete's got some notes here. We're looking at you know, strategies for individual user types, uh, which is great. Um, one of the things that we're also going to come back with you is kind of a, a best practices for what we call guiding principles for how you would manage an on-street supply. Um, and it's stuff that you can certainly push back on, but it's, it's fairly boilerplate stuff. It's, you know, we want to make sure that you know, the on-street system in the retail core is there to be supportive of those land uses that require high turnover rates. In the periphery, um, the, the primary user of that is probably not just customers, but it also could be employees. It could also be residents, um, those types of things. And so it's, it's what they amount to is just simple declarations. And what that allows us to do is to make good, uh, informed, strategy recommendations based on like simple guiding principles for how to best manage your parking supply. And if you, if we have questions or we're questioning whether, uh, how and when to implement, um, uh, a management strategy, we can go back and look at those guiding principles and say, well, this is how we should be doing it. And those, again, those are malleable. You guys can change them as best you can, but those are something that we'll, we'll include uh, in the in that report, that strategy report for you guys. Sorry, Dad, just one more thing. It, with the strategy report, do you, do you guys hook up with like Heather and Mike and go, okay, this lot that we say is off street, Oh my, for example, insurance company or the churches. Okay, we're actually going to go ahead and just drill down a little bit and take those out, and so that we get a more realistic number of like that true peak time. Because I feel if there are some adjustments that true peak time of what's really possible for people to park in, you'd see those numbers skyrocket really. I also think there's a few blocks that we have in the um, it's the northeast quadrant that are absolutely residential that people wouldn't actually park there to go to the downtown core either. So I think the border needs to be changed just a little bit. Is that something that you guys will work with Heather and Mike before, or is this set now? So we, I, we've gotten the tech mem memos in draft form uh, recently, so we're going to be reviewing those and getting that work. Okay. So, yeah, one of the things I, I, um, we can refine some of the numbers in terms of what is quote publicly available off street. And, um, you know, I, I would, it, um, I would, I would want to focus that conversation on the core. I'm less concerned with it outside of it simply because I don't think that's necessarily a great use of resources. Um, what we will be doing is we'll provide strategies that are specific to how to best manage or create um, shared use agree arrangements with off street facilities. And so it, it won't be for a specific site, but it'll be a, it'll be a broad recommendation. Say this is how you would go about or, you know, go to explore uh, off street, um, you know, uh, shared use opportunities with off street operators. And what we'll do is we'll use that list of off street facilities that we did, um, that we did measure that we did count those, those utilization rates on, and we'll identify how many stalls they have available in the peak hour. And those are the ones that you kind of want to go after. Um, even though it might be private and accessory use, we'll compare it to existing code to make sure that it's uh, a shared use agreement wouldn't violate any, um, any code uh, where we could put other users into that into that supply where we're doing it either by way of permit or 
designating it as visitor parking with the appropriate signage. You know, I don't know if that's permissible or not, but those are the things that we'll want to explore. Uh, and those will be part of that strategy recommendations, but they will be more broad. It's not specific to uh, any particular lot per se. example it's similar to a church lot where during the weekday it was it was pretty packed and then weekend I think there were six cars there um, so I think it's a, it's screaming for an opportunity maybe to do a shared use agreement or think creatively about that space to alleviate that downtown core think about putting some other people there so uh, and so there are people who aren't here from the advisory committee and they want to make sure we pass on to you think outside the box can't uh, speak for Pete too, but I, I'm, we're really impressed with your downtown. We think it's, uh, you guys got a lot of great stuff going on here and it's it's equally matched by what we saw in the data. And it's, you know, our, um, it, the data is, you know, it takes the human element a little bit out of it, um, which is both, you know, good and bad. It's it's kind of, a, um, you know, it's, it's agnostic about, you know, who's using it, but it's more about, you know, how it's being used. And so then we try to create strategies to make sure that we're making good use and we're getting all the people that need to access that parking um, into the right spaces at the right time. That's what real good parking management is all about. Um, the one thing that we'll say about management, we do say this everywhere we go, is that uh, the key word in parking management is indeed management. And uh, going forward, these strategies that we'll outline for you are things to take forward, but it's gonna require an ongoing effort on the part of, of you as citizens, but also the city itself too, and making sure that um, you know we're implementing some of those strategies to make sure that we're making the highest and best use of our existing parking supply. Because one of those things about scarce resources is New supply is very, very expensive. Um, you know, you're talking about thirty thousand dollars a stall in structured parking. So it's um, it, that doesn't go. Your know, big dollars don't go very far when you're looking at developing a, a structured parking situation. So it's it's behooven unto us in terms of consultants, but also uh, the fiduciary responsibility of the city to make sure that um, we're making the highest and best use of our existing supply, because that is the most accessible, already built, and most inexpensive available parking that's out there. It, there's there will be an estimate in there, but it's not a performa estimate. It's it's a it's a more of I wouldn't call it it's a little bit more of a an exaggerated back of the napkin. It'll be more of a, a deluxe version of that based on some assumed cost for land and things like that. Yeah. Oh yeah. Feeling comfortable about the parking program, what color would we be looking for across the board? 
I, I would say, well, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say orange. Yeah. Uh, so it, it, when you get into that 85 plus, that's when, as Owen was saying, you, you looked at management, active manage, actively managing your parking supply. So you're kind of in a reactive mode where you're like, oh, oh my gosh, we're doing really well, but we're actually maybe creating more of a bit of a problem for our, our patrons that are coming down to McMinnville. Whereas that orange uh, number, which is that 70 to 84 percent, that's the sweet spot. So people are driving, they're quickly finding a space, uh, one or two spaces on a block, and they're pulling in. They're staying for a little bit, and you hopefully your time stays are, are allocated correctly. They're staying for the appropriate amount of time, and then you're turning over that stall. So um, orange is your, is your number that you, or your color you want to shoot for. <laughs> And then you'll you'll see you know yellows and greens around the edges, but it would be great you know one of the things too is good distribution, so as a good distribution of color. So it's we know that there's hot spots, but if if you can drive some of the the uh, when you got the the habituated traffic, people that are r always there um, into those areas of green, you can create you know um, yellows and some of where those green areas are. And eventually, those will become orange themselves. So, but it's developments like the hotel and other things that are, you know, going to put new demands on the system too. So, uh, we'll definitely take those into consideration going forward as well. So, well, we really appreciate this. Uh, thank you for having us. And, and if you have any questions, um, you can either send them to Heather, and she can pass them on to us. Uh, and then hopefully you get a chance to review some of the, the tech memos that are out and we'll have another tech memo out at the end of the, by the end of the month. Yeah, and then for those who are interested, we'll post the tech memos and the PDF and PowerPoint on our website and in the planning department. We'll set up a parking project if you don't set up yet uh, so you can access it from there or you can email me and I'll send it. Great. Thank you guys. Thanks very much. Mm -hmm.